Uh, I guess it's been a little bit over a week uh, since NAB 2018 happened, um, and there was a ton of stuff going on at the show, a uh, ton of stuff to see, ton of stuff to talk about. And so now that we've had some time to sort of process everything and think over what we liked, what we didn't like, some stuff that we missed, um, I wanted to do a sort of wrap-up show. Um, and of course, we are doing this live. Uh, so if you guys have any questions or comments along the way, please feel free to go ahead and pop them in the chat. Um, and our special guest and I will be answering those questions along the way as we talk about various topics. Um, and so, yeah, I can also uh, pop those up on the screen for you guys if it decides to cooperate with me and my stream deck doesn't want to. Here we go right here. We've already got some people in here. We've got uh, we've got Shiznuts and we've got, uh, I believe that's Derek Allen from uh, Gear Jones. Good to see you guys. Um, and Shiznuts, yes, you are on time uh, for once. That's awesome. So guys, if this is your first time here, please make sure that you go ahead and subscribe down below so that you guys can always get notified uh, whenever we have a live show going up. And uh, you can come and join in with these fine people in our uh, conversation. And uh, we, we have something a little bit different today. Like I said, we have a special guest coming on to go through everything. Uh, but we also have set up some show notes because there's a lot of stuff that we want to go through today. So uh, in order to keep ourselves sort of on track and our thoughts organized, we have uh, created a Google Doc of show notes. There is a link in the description down below, guys. So if you want to follow along and see the notes and links that we're referring to, you can go ahead and check that out, that out either during the show or after the show. But without further ado, I've got him sitting here waiting and teed up. Uh, let me get his volume up. But we have our special guest for the day. Let me get him up here. We have Mr. Devin Hansen. Good to see you, Devin. Gee, special guest. Special guest, man. You're the first. <laughs> would... It said it in the I title guess... and everything. Yeah. How did you not know I was going to announce you that way? I, I, you're right. It does say special guest in the title. I shouldn't have been surprised. That's you should have checked Johnson's the title. Match. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, you you are our first, uh, our first live, uh, uh, live guest on the show. And actually... It's because of you helping me out how to figure out how to do all this stuff that it, you're even appearing on the screen and, and people are able to hear you. So, <laughs> so yeah, it just made well, sense I, to I have you. I guess I should be honored. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for those of you who, who might not know Devin, uh, Devin does uh, work with uh, the DSLR Film Noob channel. Uh, that's where I first saw you. And then we, uh, we met uh, on the show floor at NAB last year, actually. Um, which was cool. Yeah. And then uh, you again went to the show this year, as did I. Um, and while we, we realized we didn't actually get to go uh, <laughs> and explore anything together, because, you know, we were just off all over the place, um, we, we did see some of the same things and we saw some different things. You saw some stuff that I didn't get to see. I saw some stuff that you didn't necessarily get to see. And so we've got a pretty good roundup um, today of the stuff we want to talk about. Uh, yeah. So let's see here. Oh, yeah, people are already uh, saying uh, they, they know you, man. You're famous. See, I told you. <laughs> That's a lie. Hey, you go no, and yeah, to listen to me. Shiznuts is saying uh, to give Devin a follow at Devo Cut. Yeah, I've got your I've got your social uh, information down below. So guys, go ahead and follow him. There you go. Um, but yeah, so we are going to dive into uh, some of the stuff um, during the show. And so I guess because we got a lot to go through, we might as well just uh, go ahead and dive in, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Let's get going. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> like I said, guys, sorry, it's my first time managing so many different things here. So as right. I said, guys, we do have our uh, our show notes available. So I have them to pull up here on the screen if you guys want to go ahead and follow along. That link is down in the description. Um, but yeah, we're going to do some highlights and, and a wrap up here. Uh, and the first thing I have on here is that one of the big themes, at least that I thought uh, from the show this year, was that it seemed to be uh, kind of the year of RGB. Uh, people sort of unofficially announce or give a title to each year, like one year was 360, one year was 3D, one year was 8K. And I think this year kind of felt like the year of RGB. Um, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. But 
not in a good way but i guess we could say that about like any 360 or anything like that for me the uh the big concern while there's definitely like a lot of exciting project uh products coming out of like quasar science and other companies like that uh, I'm, I'm really i would say be very cautious because now that rgb is becoming the new trend a lot of very cheap light manufacturers that you have never heard of before uh when they're employing an rgb light their version of white light is usually taking the rgb channels and just broadcasting them all Makes and sense. as you've done videos on cri and everything else white light's a lot more complicated than just having a few spikes of color that kind of look white to the human eye when it comes to our cameras and our sensors so there's there's a lot of rgb lights that looked flashy and then when i set them to white and a cold white and a warm white they looked like garbage yeah so um well all that doesn't mean they still can't be useful as a special effects light uh, i'd be careful the lights that i saw the new products um Quasar Science, I think, is making huge leaps in uh, uh, what they're trying to design, what they're trying to do. They're really listening to the community, and so props to them. And um, besides that, like, and then, of course, your big ones, your sky panels and stuff like that, they're all getting into it, too. But yeah. in terms of kind of being cost-effective and being interesting and unique, I really like the Quasar Science guys. Yeah, Quasar Science, um, I've worked with some of their lights, uh, but I've never been able to get a hold of some because they were so reasonably priced. They're always kind of sold out. Um, and if you guys don't know what these are, go check them out. But uh, they're like tube style, like LED lights. And they had ones before that were just solid color or, or bicolor. Uh, but yeah, they had a, a presence this year with a whole bunch of RGB ones. Um, that look pretty good and they make some pretty quality stuff. So I'd love to get my hands on those and That's interesting what you said about White light because there are lights that are called RGBW So are those different? Do they actually <laughs> have like a Say it, daylight okay, LED it, in it. It, it depends because um, I mean these terms can be used however people would like but in what you're talking about with RGBW um, that typically means that yes they do have a chip that is dedicated to white and should get you more of a broad spectrum white coming out of it yeah. keep in mind though that that chip is usually kind of like set to either like a tungsten not usually but a tungsten or a, um, a daylight and yeah. so if it's set to a daylight they might just be adding a bit of uh, red and green and things like that in order to bring it down to a tungsten. And then you're not really gonna get a good tungsten because you're really mixing like this very blue light and you're trying to add more than blue to it. It, it gets it gets messy and it's not fun. And so, but keep in mind, like I said, as a special effects light, like music videos and stuff, yeah. it's kind of cool that like for a 50, a hundred bucks, you can get like some really bright RGB lights that have some programmability to it or something like that. Um, but uh, unless you really spend some good money on it, I wouldn't expect your RGB lights to replace any kind of your normal white photography lights. Yeah, good point. And that's a really good point about like like you said, and I saw too, you know, the, the picture in the notes is of me standing there at the Came TV booth. Um, obviously a Chinese manufacturer, um, their products have been seeming to improve in quality in terms of their light, but they had a full slew of RGB. You went through that whole China pavilion there uh, with their, all their companies. <laughs> and I mean, it was lit up like a dance party because of all the RGB lights. And so, yeah, just because they're RGB doesn't mean um, that they're going to be replacements for your regular lights. And also people have to start thinking about like how you're going to use RGB lights. So you were saying, you know, obviously for effects lights, they're great, but you want to be able to, you know, if, if you're getting a good light, you want to be able to do other things with it. So yeah, you would want to be able to do, uh, also just, you know, 5,600 all the way to 3,200, you know, not always have to just be blasting a stylized color. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, we saw some different implementations of how to replicate other colors. And actually the next one that I want to talk about, um, as we move along in the show notes is, is, uh, a really clever implementation of this. And, uh, let me pull up the notes there. So as we go along, so yeah, there I am when the, the lightsaber field of, of all the came TV lights. Um, but aperture, uh, I think everybody knows that I love aperture. Um, they make fantastic stuff and people have been begging them forever for an RGB light and they had this super secret film dinner um, That uh, they actually revealed this prototype now I want to stress prototype because people are getting on their case, uh, but it's called aperture RGB um, 
and so you can see it on here. Uh, but so they released this RGB panel, and so it does a lot more in theory because it's still a prototype than just okay, you can you know make red, green, blue, and do all these stylized things. Um, one of the cool implementations that they have is they're pairing it with a what they call their color picker. Um, and it's a little remote that you can point it at anything, um, you know, a fabric, uh, a, a room wall, like paint color, even another light or even the sunset or a fire or something like that. And the light's going to be able to duplicate the color of that. Um, and so while this still seems very stylized kind of usage, one of the amazing examples that they gave is, OK, say you walk into uh, an office setting and you need to shoot in there and it's lit with those hideous fluorescents that have a bit of green in them. Um, you know, all of your nice lights, you're always going to be battling this green. It's going to be in your final image. So what you can do is actually point the color picker at those lights. It'll duplicate that sort of green tinge that's coming. And then it, it will match those lights perfectly. So then when you remove the green in post, it's universal. Um, so it's not like you have a perfectly lit subject with your nice lights and your background and everything else has this weird green tinge um, and you you know have a color editing nightmare. So I thought that was a really clever at least idea of, of how to implement RGB lighting. Have you seen anybody else do anything like that? I know sky panels are like the one to beat, but... Uh, you know, for the most part... Um... No, it, Aperture is looking for a practical application, which I think is necessary because, as a lot of people can say, it's like, man, you throw a gel on it. Like, yeah, uh, it's 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 not that hard for me to bring my jelly roll with me and slap it onto a light. Uh, you know, the the bi color thing was really helpful in terms of finding a good white because kind of going colder or warmer on white can be difficult, but. Uh, it, it, but that was mostly a response to the fact that, like, look, if you've got broad spectrum, like you have a, pro a proper HMI, which a lot of us don't bother with because it is a real pain compared to today's standards. Yeah. Uh, that that has such a broad spectrum that you can just filter out and get to a colder light if you want to or a warmer light. So it's one of those where uh, it's because LEDs are limited in the in the frequencies that they produce that then by color made sense because then you could get the best of both worlds. Yeah. And so this is kind of the next step where um you know not that people are looking for high quality blue if that makes sense like yeah. putting up their little yeah. uh, spectrometer how good is this blue yeah, Usually people just want blue uh but um I, I see leds going this way because um it just it allows for uh better control but for me a lot of it just feels like marketing like you're right aperture kind of found a special use case yeah but for me it doesn't apply because one i mean let's be realistic this light is probably going to be a thousand bucks or more probably um, more I think yeah. that's safe to say um and so when you consider that cost i mean for me personally with my scale and talking about using dslrs and slightly cheaper cameras i'm like uh if i'm spending that much it's my primary light like it's a 300d or something like yeah. that it's something where i'm like i'm gonna use this all the time and um and it's hard to justify the rgb for that purpose their color one too i imagine is going to be a separate accessory and that color one for picking out colors is probably going to run like 500 dollars or something crazy too because if it's going to be accurate to grab color like that we're talking about borderline scientific equipment here that has high accuracy and that means it's going to be expensive yeah. and so it's all cool i really love it uh, it's one of those where I don't see myself really using it, uh, which is a little unfortunate, but it just a lot of that just kind of comes down to the cost and that that feature of matching those lights is not something I need every time. Because while you mentioned, say, like an office setting, I go, yeah, but if I'm shooting in an office, I'm carrying light gear. It's totally different. If you're a dude with a grip truck and all this other stuff, yeah. maybe that's what Aperture's aiming for and Aperture's trying to get into rental houses. And that really makes sense. Uh, but moving from where Aperture has been in the past, which is like, hey, we build like these small panels, we build for the solo shooters, the DSLR guys, we price it appropriately. This feels like a departure from that. And not that that's a bad thing. I love to see the company growing and doing what they're doing. It's just one of those where I'm like, I don't see myself using it, but I do see where it's going and it's super cool. If they maybe like start doing RGB in their cheaper panels, possibly, but as far as I can tell, they aren't interested in producing cheaper panels now. They're very much on the up and up. Hmm. Interesting. See, I was kind of hoping that, I mean, if you look at this thing, it's 
it's a tank like it's big you know yeah. it's uh it's a pro light one of the things they touted about it was um you know the dmx uh i'm not you know an, a dmx control expert but yeah you know this could be something where you could outfit like an entire show or something like that with these lights and do different effects and all that kind of stuff and so yeah that seems like more who this would be for because i mean even it's just a, a, a panel, you know, it's larger than their LS1 panels, but if I'm lighting an interview, I'm taking an LS1 panel. Um, yeah. So what I was kind of hoping is that they're doing sort of a reverse uh, product path from maybe what they've done before, where they've started with the little ones and built up and up and up and up, and now we're to like the 300D. I was kind of hoping that maybe, all right, this is the mothership of lights, and then maybe once they get that tech perfect, we, we can see it trickle down into some smaller panels uh, for, you know, people who need to fit everything into the trunk of a car uh, for a full kit. So we'll see. Um, you know, I didn't get to ask them about what the path is for that. Uh, I do want everybody to realize this thing is just a prototype. They were even saying it's like pre-prototype. Like it works. It did all the colors, all that kind of stuff. They're figuring out that color picker thing, um, getting it to, uh, you know, getting it to, to work properly and do what they want. Um, I didn't get any specs on output, on you know range, on uh, you know how wide the beam is, how, how soft it is, what it looks like. You know, we were there in that room for dinner, and it was very much just like it, we we pretty much had it blasting like aperture red the whole time. Um, but they are saying they're hoping by the end of this year, people are realistically estimating probably beginning of next year, and there is no pricing available, and they couldn't even guess. So, you know, any speculation at this point is just speculation. So, um, but yeah, it was a cool thing. People were, people were on them about RGB. And uh, I think they did this really just to be like, hey, we're not sitting here ignoring you. Look, we're working on something. It's like way far away, but we're working on it. So that was cool. And I love those Aperture guys. They're, they're awesome dudes. Uh, I'm going to take a quick peek at our chat here. I know we've got a few things going on, but we're going to keep things moving at a good pace here, guys. But just real quick, do, do, do. let's see if we got anything in here. Uh, Trevor says, how much total white output are you giving up to incorporate RGB? Uh, I don't know. That would depend on different lights. Uh, and Yeah, in, yeah. That, uh, that's a prototype, so I know that you can't speak to it, so I thought yeah. I'd interject. Um, typically, like... In most of these RGB cases, it's not so much that you're giving up a certain... It, it depends on the design, but you take something like Quasar tubes, and I'm not an engineer for them, so I can't comment directly for them. Um, but as far as what I've seen uh, using a few of their products is that they have their maximum output throughout their entire range. Uh, when you get into the price of your lights, a lot of people, you know, you're used to like, oh, hey, um, this, you know, if you get the daylight only, it's going to be brighter and stronger than the bi panel. And like, oh, this certain part of the bi panel is going to be brighter because you're mixing the two. Um, in terms of like that, that's a cost saving thing when you get into the higher end stuff and you're looking at light uh sky panels and things like that what what is actually defining its output is usually whatever it's using as a ballast i mean which is more of an older term for hmis but yeah it's, it's electronics it's either what you're using for your electronics uh or in terms of power your battery output that's the limiting factor yeah. and you put in led chips that are well beyond the limiting factor so then no matter what color you're picking whether you go full white or you're doing a mixture um that is what says okay i'm only going to give you 100 watts because that's all i can give you is 100 watts and the leds will do say 150 watts so they don't care they'll max out however they're able to max out so therefore you get kind of the same brightness across everything that the light provides so you're right typically in the cheaper panels you would talk about like how much power do I lose when I don't mix it or when I go full you know 56k or something like that yeah. uh, that's not gonna be a problem for the higher-end lights and I imagine for apertures light because they're putting so much behind and so much power we probably have a similar situation where they have um, I mean, they didn't take the light apart as far as I saw, no. uh, but the design of it looks like they're working off of somewhat of a parabolic uh, reflector, which tells me that they're putting all their RGBs in the middle. So that, that way it's a more even distribute uh, distribution, which makes sense. Gotcha. And uh, with doing that, 
uh, my chances are they probably have four. They probably have an RGB, and then they probably have a warm white and a cold light because uh, to do LEDs in an RGB fashion, that's kind of how you have to do them. And rather than mixing them all together and then having this really big panel that has very little output, they're condensing it all into a you know sky panel kind of design. So yeah. So hopefully it doesn't mean much. It's a prototype, so it's not like we have hard numbers on it. But that's something to think about in terms of when you buy LED panels, spend more money and you'll probably get something that doesn't have these output issues depending on where you're at. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, filmmaking stuff tends to be priced appropriately for... Uh... <laughs> So, yeah, it, you usually get what you pay for. You know, it's cliche, but it really is. But, you know, it all remains to be seen with the Aperture One, and it remains to be seen with all these other companies because, as like I said, there were a ton of them. So they're going to be coming out. People are going to figure out how to put them in their workflow. People are going to figure out what ones do what better and all that kind of stuff. But it's, uh, like I said, it was the year of RGB. It's the new sort of thing. And so we're going to just have to wait and see. So, um so the next thing uh, that I want to talk about is something uh, not necessarily that was at the show, but something that we both noticed was not at the show. Uh, and we're going to talk about our, our good friends there over at uh, GoPro. So there was no GoPro booth at all this year at the show. And uh, we know that GoPro has been having issues and all sorts of problems and stuff like that. Um, and... I've seen over the past four years, their booth has come from like a giant thing where they're shooting t-shirt cannons and all that kind of stuff to, all right, getting a little bit smaller to last year. They were what I would call a very reasonable conservative booth. Um, and this year they weren't there at all. Uh, so what do you think this is saying about <laughs> GoPro? <laughs> I, I think it goes to show that GoPro's in in a little bit of trouble. I think GoPro is playing catch up at this point. Yeah. Um, they they transitioned over into really kind of controlling all points of manufacturing because uh, we know GoPro reached the point where it's like, hey, you can't just buy somebody else's chip on a board, their sensor on a board, and write the software alone and think you have a competitive product because while the software is great. Because it is. It, it's good stuff. While it's great, um, other competitors are just going to buy the exact same hardware. And even though their software may suck, it works well enough and they s save the consumer $200 or $300. So it's really hard for GoPro to compete with that. And GoPro transitioning to making their own hardware made sense. Yeah. Unfortunately, that happened right when 360 started to take over and everything else. I think the fact they're trying to do too much at once, they wanted to get into the drone market. They obviously had problems there. That's, and that's completely wanted... dead now, right? I think they yeah. they scrapped that whole project. They, they scrapped it. I think a lot of them they pulled back. They did warranty and stuff like that. I think a lot of people actually got their money back, which is good on GoPro. But, um, yeah, a lot of that scrapped. And then when they went over to 360, I mean, it's probably the clunkiest 360 system I've seen, which doesn't make sense from a company with with a, a great team of programmers. Um, you know, Talking about the, has, the Fusion? Fusion, yeah, yeah. Anyone who hasn't used a Fusion, it's like it literally is two cameras stuck together in the sense that it takes two memory cards. Each memory card just records the raw fisheye effect, and then uh, you need software to combine it. And the software to combine it sucks because let's say, oh, I want this five-second clip like, you know, 10 minutes into my 60-minute recording. It has to render the entire 60-minute recording to then give you that five-minute clip. Wow. So it's, it's like – really poorly designed it's not super thought out it really feels like a beta product that they kind of push to market really fast to stay competitive and unfortunately it just like they have good ideas let's their idea of like using a shot of the 360 image while they can't say they're the ones who came up with it they're the first company who like commercially made a piece of software where you can click and do that yeah now all the other 360 companies are doing it better. And so that's a crappy situation to be in. So I'm not surprised that like GoPro is having problems because they kept trying to be in the consumer market and in the professional market and straddle the two. Yeah. And I felt like that's where it stinks because in the professional market, we now have stuff like a Z cam, we've had black magic pockets for a long time and don't take my word for it. I mean, look at the industry like Mythbusters in their last three or four seasons switched to black magic pockets for all their crash cams yep. from GoPro. So, so they aren't making it in the pro market and then in the consumer market you got all this chinese stuff on amazon um i'm sorry that's like a 
negative thing to say. You have these other competitors, you know, out of Shenzhen. That's not a negative like thing that. anymore. I mean, it, it's not. It's even not. Aperture really and a lot stuff. of these others, like Xiumen that's making the crane, these are all Chinese companies. Know. Chinese I'm, no longer means I'm trying, cheap and, I'm and bad. I'm trying to make sure. I know. I'm You're trying safe. To make sure You're safe. Guys, guys cut him a break. You know what he meant. <laughs> Uh, but you you know all the copycat companies too that yeah. also just dump crap on Amazon and even those companies are reaching the consumers uh, better than GoPro is just on pricing alone. And yeah, so, because the people who who don't care and they're like, I just want a tiny camera that records you know 1080 for when I go on vacation or whatever. Price matters to them. So five hundred dollars versus ninety nine dollars and they can't really see the difference. Ninety nine dollars is going to win every time. Yeah, and and I've done a few reviews for those uh, really cheap cameras, and to be honest, the Yi was the nail in the coffin because yeah. Yi's been coming out with very similar quality, slightly more features, and Yi is not like developing their own hardware. They're using Sony sensors yeah. on some basic boards, and they're just writing a bit of software. And like, yeah. I mean, their their like image stabilization and low light mode is all stuff Sony bakes into their chips and their sensors. So they're not doing anything complicated other than making a cheap Sony and it's crushing GoPro in almost every department and so it just stinks because GoPro was this inventive company and we want to see them succeed um, and I've been very happy with a lot of their products but it just comes like dude you can't be in the middle either you're going to attack the consumer and you're going to go hard on your GoPro Hero series for mm -hmm. low-end consumers yeah and you're going to make that better or you got to go after the pro market and you got to start talking interchangeable lenses, but that's a market they have no experience with. Not saying they couldn't take a stab at it and jump in, but now you've got to worry about Z cam as yeah. well as black magic and all the other mini ones. So yeah. I don't know. It's, it, kind of feels like it's too late i'm not sure where gopro is going but they've got to pivot i mean they own cineform there's definitely stuff they can do in the pro market if they attack that yeah and if you guys want to help gopro out they're throwing another hail mary uh trade up offer again uh, and i put the the link in the notes for you guys uh they are once again offering a trade-in deal uh to get a hundred dollars off a hero six or a fusion which is supremely overpriced i think it's like 700 dollars for the fusion uh but yeah they're doing this deal where if you uh send in any gopro any old one working or not working uh you know they said even like melted in a fire or whatever um you get a hundred dollars off uh, a gopro um so they did this again last year they threw a little hail mary with the hero 5 try and get people to buy it um i actually did end up getting a hundred dollars off my hero 5 uh, you know, there was a bit of a snafu with getting my old camera back to them. And so they may or may not have ever received that. And I just kind of got a hundred bucks off, but you know, can't prove anything. But guys, if you do want to go check out and get a, uh, a GoPro Hero 6 for a hundred dollars off, which actually makes it probably more the price that it should be anyway, um, that link is in there. Um, now the next thing that we got, and you were sort of segueing into this and you know a lot more about this, uh, than I do. Um, is 360 and the implementation yeah. of 360. So I asked you yesterday uh, when we were sort of prepping for this show, uh, is, is 360 still a thing? Like uh, we, we had seen it even just last year. We saw a ton of it. This is just a, a random photo, guys. This isn't a specific <laughs> product. That was just my representation of 360. Um, but yeah, not as much of it that I saw this year. Um, and... Uh, you you yeah. sort of know a lot about it. So is it is it still a thing? And how are we using 360 now? Uh, I still don't see a lot of people using it. I mean, with my, um, you know, I, I, I only work in certain departments over like at Red Bull and stuff like that. But uh, from what I see with people using 360, it's like 360 really needs to be built around this experience. It needs to be built around, um, it, it's, there's just not a lot of people willing to put on a headset to watch something and I've seen like great uses of it in the past uh, one if you guys are looking for a VR or not a VR thing but a 360 video I think Matt Pat uh, a YouTuber does a trip to Tokyo or something like that oh. he's got like a great thing where he makes use of the space and it kind of makes you feel like you're there the main problem with capturing um, 
360 is that it's not 3D, but you're still rotating. So it's kind of like being inside a bubble, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so you really lose a sense of depth and everything else. All these cinematography tools and techniques that we've learned go out the window because there's really no room for them with 360. So. I've seen a few interesting experiences that kind of make it worse to put on a headset, um, but it's not nearly the same as even um, like 3D video. I would argue 3D video, there's more there to do cinematically speaking in terms of telling a story. 360, like you, you like need a swivel chair. I know it sounds silly, but it's like you yeah. can't even really do it on your couch. Um, Otherwise, like if you just face one direction, then it kind of loses like its value as a 360 video. So I, I see potential in the future. Uh, you know, we talk about in sports and stuff like that, being able to pan and tilt the camera where you want. Yeah. But that's still talking more about a 2D experience, but giving the consumer camera control, which is alleviated rather than having a bunch of people trying to control a motorized camera. It's alleviated by using 360. Yeah. Um, so I, I think in terms of like VR, part of it too is the detail quality is always crap. There's not enough sensors for, um, you know, such a wide angle lens. It's just never that sharp. It's just always low quality. That's a lot of technology stuff that takes a long time to catch up. Uh, but it really, I, I see like VR slowly becoming a thing because I've seen really impressive 3D work done with VR. Um, and a lot of VR stuff will be done with 180 degrees uh, because it's really hard to do VR with like a full 360, just with the way that gotcha. the eye, eye separation is and all this kind of stuff. But 180 degree VR or like 120 degree VR, um, I see that being very cool for storytelling and making you feel immersed in things like that. Uh, but it's still, I don't know. It's, it's like we saw a lot of rigs. I don't see people watching 360. I don't see people sharing 360. The only time 360 like kind of makes sense is when somebody is somewhere and people can pan and tilt the camera themselves. But th if they're controlling the camera, then you know you're lost. You've lost that cinematic language or that storytelling ability. Yeah. You've given up that tool to the consumer, and it's up to them to then tell the story. So it works for short experiences. I just don't see people getting excited enough to share it with other people. Well, one of the things that was interesting, a different sort of implementation of it that you were telling me about yesterday was uh, something that does uh, stabilization. So I know even in the GoPro software with the Fusion, you can record a full 360 and then you can go through the shot afterwards and actually do your camera moves because you've captured everything. So you can go through the shot yeah. after the fact and you can control your camera moves. So you can do like pan and tilt if, as you're like walking along through like, you know, walking down a New York street or something, you capture the whole thing in 360, but then you can do just a 2D experience, but sort of do your camera moves in post. And you were telling me something, uh, an implementation yeah. of it for stabilization. You were... Yeah, that's that's something, um, I think Instant 360 has this uh, Rylo, if you pronounce, if I pronounce that right, R-Y-O-L-O -O or something like that. Um, they probably have some of the best software I've seen. Um, they've demoed their stuff to me before. It, it seems to be slightly, it's its more consumer oriented, but it seems to be slightly smoother software experience than GoPro right now. But GoPro is the one that first came to market with, I think it's called an overshot, but it's where you can pick a 2D shot out of your 360 image. Yeah. And because we're talking about action cameras, which have high frame rate, um, or not the high frame rate, but like a high shutter speed, because they don't have you know a lot of virus control and yeah. things like that. None. Um, it's it's stabilization tends to work really well because normally digital stabilization looks kind of crappy but considering that you're capturing all over the place you can have this crazy stabilization where you can literally have like a truck flipping over with a camera attached to it and be able to stabilize it to the level ground so the truck like flips over the camera and th this is only because you are capturing the entire 360 image as well as that look i mean if you've seen the gopro fusion then you know what i'm talking about we're able to feel like there's a cameraman like a couple feet uh, behind the subject and the, and that's because, you know, the pull is in a specific spot where the camera's canceling out that edge and everything else. Uh, but that's like a super cool look that you can't get any other way. Yeah. And so whenever you can get a, you know, get a special look that you can't get any other way, then I go, that's legit. And that's something I want to explore more of. So um, I, I definitely see a future for that in action cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just going to take a while for action cameras to get up to the quality where we like look at that image and go, wow, that's a really great 1080p image. I mean, we're still yeah. not there yet. They, sh they can 
capture 4K and but then in 360 <laughs> degrees it equates to 4K. So what you're looking right. at is like so so then when you do your little your little oh okay I want to get this little shot here it's like you know barely you know it's less than 720 so it's rough right now but yeah. I'm excited for it because uh, just the thought of being able to attach cameras to different spots and make it look like it's an external camera from the body it's attached to um, normally that's something where long ago back in the days of like standard definition um, or when DSLRs were first coming out we would do that look by attaching a DSLR way off the back of a car with a pole and then I would paint out the pole in After Effects for the Ooh. entire shot. And and it sucks and it's rough. And uh, so to ha say, hey, here's an action camera that weighs nothing and you can get the exact same look without any, like, touching any of the, of the footage. I'm like, yes, give me more of that. So I'm excited for that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, like I said, there's it's new ways of thinking about using 360 as opposed to just being like, Oh, I capture everything around me and you can move your head. So, yeah, that's that's cool implementation. So, I'll be looking <laughs> forward to that, uh, you know, when they get the software and the cameras up to spec. So, but it, it feels like the initial fire of 360 and everyone going nuts over it has sort of uh, died down, which yeah. I'm okay with. But speaking of one fire going out and another one starting, our next uh our next thing I know is going to uh have a lot of debate over the following months. And that, of course, guys, it's the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Uh, so we've been wanting this for a while. I was kind of uh, half expecting it to, to be announced last year. Uh, but it uh, was not, but it is here now. And uh, it is anything but pocket-sized. Uh, but we're not going to go super in-depth on it because, guys, I did a whole show on the Pocket 4K for our live show last week. I did have hands-on experience with it, got to, got to check it out, didn't get to record anything, um, but there is uh, a link to that show uh, in the description down below and in the show notes. Uh, so if you really want to see me talk for an hour uh, and share photos and all that kind of stuff of my experience with that camera, go and check that out. We're just going to talk about... Uh, some of the some of the overall specs of it as they've been told to us now and sort of what this means for both black magic and also for other companies um so you know the big things about this camera the 4k 60p raw internal recording um that's amazing uh 1080p up to 120 frames per second windowed so basically when you're shooting that high frame rate it is a crop on the sensor um, and uh, so it, it's it's almost acting like uh, an Ursa Ursa Mini. Um, you know, those are the same frame rates that you get from the Ursa Mini. And it's funny the guys were telling me they were trying to figure out whether to call it the Pocket Camera or the Ursa Micro. Um, but yeah, so uh, dual ISOs of 400 and 3200. So in theory, uh, better uh, ISO performance at higher ISOs because you have that other native one at 3200. Um, and my other notes in here are just saying that, you know, the final versions is going to have different color science, so you're still optimizing the sensor, all that stuff. So with that out of the way, uh, what did you think about this camera? Um, are you going to be picking it up? Uh, I, I know the uh, the thumbnail for this show kind of gives it away. You you holding your, your old pocket cinema camera in disgust almost. Um, yeah. And uh, who should be worried about this uh, in terms of others in the industry? Uh, you know, it's really, it's aggressive pricing. And I think that, um, oh, man, cause it's, it's, it's still too big. It's a little too clunky. They have done things to try to make it a vlog camera. I think that's a bad direction for them to take. I, do too. I don't think they need, I don't think they need to be concerned with it being a vlogging camera, at least at that size, because, um, uh, th Sony has been killing it in terms of vlogging cameras. I'm yeah. not a big Sony guy. I don't like the way that the colors look and stuff, though. You can always shoot flat in color later. But I'm not a huge Sony guy. But I know Sony is dominating the vlog market because they look great. They're 4K and they're light. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, that's one of those features that this camera doesn't have. But the pricing is aggressive as if it's trying to reach that part of the consumer market. So 
Um, I, I think really what it comes down to is it's more just the indie filmmakers. I could see a lot of guys that, uh, you know, maybe were looking at a GH5 for cinematic purposes. They're a student making short films and things like that. I really feel like it dominates that. Of course, it's always going to be a crash cam for your Ursa or whatever. It's always going to be like... Well, think about the original like Pocket. Camera. Those were the people who bought no, yeah. the original Pocket. Like we, Yeah, exactly. I, I, it I, says I, cinema I, camera in the name. They don't just put that there for fun. I can't tell you how many right. times I've told people but, that stuff. But remember, remember last time when the uh, pocket came out, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when the pocket came out, back. I think we were on the eve of the GH4. And so you had an option of like, hey, here's a DSLR before anyone else who's shooting 4K, and here's a pocket camera that does 1080. And it's a great looking 1080, and I've used it a lot, and my clients ask for it a lot. But it's one of those where people like chasing after the higher quality standards will be like, ah, maybe I'll go with the GH4 and have the 4K and the few extra features. Uh, uh, well, now this could pull a few people from Panasonic into Blackmagic if that's their objective is doing the short filmmaking and everything else or shooting their first feature and stuff like that because you have the 4K, you have the 10-bit color, and you have all that way cheaper than Panasonic is doing it. Um, as well, too, I mean, I feel like most people chase after Sony because of low light, so you're not going to pull people away from the Sony camp if that's the camera that they like right now, but I could definitely see it changing people's minds about getting a GH5S. Um, yeah. It's, and, it, and yeah, it's, that's a good point because uh, somebody was commenting on my video just the other day, and they were like, well, you know, you're comparing it to the Ursa Mini, but shouldn't have better low light performance than the Ursa Mini because it has the dual ISOs. And, you know, 3200, it's like even higher than the Ursa Mini goes, period. Um, and I was saying, I was like, but you got to take into a, uh, account the, the sensor size, too. It's micro four thirds. Yeah. So inherently, just by size, it is gathering far less light than that Super 35 sensor. So I don't know, you know, what the algorithm is for calculating the, the stops lost by sensor size and all that kind of stuff and, and whatever. So can't do it until I have them side by side and actually like show you like here's what they look like. But no, no, yeah, you're That's gonna get similar point. performance. Let's... It's a perfect B cam for my Ursa Mini, and I kind of well, want one. We, we have we have to wait until we see it. I yeah. I. I didn't do a pre-order because I need to see some footage out of it first. Very much play so. around, Push it around and everything else. But uh, you're right. Um, in terms of like, you know, how much light you're going to get, a lot of that's super dependent. It just comes down to when you have a larger sensor and the fact that we're doing 1080p and stuff like that, you, you tend to just have larger uh, pixels and therefore then that pixel is capturing more light so it's able to represent more light digitally. Yeah. So it's just when you go with a smaller sensor, uh, even if the resolution's the same, you have to account for the space in between the pixels that isn't able to capture light because the pixels are squished together. And so that's why you tend to get less low light performance. Um, part of it too is that there's just less cooling in a smaller sensor. It's harder to pull heat away from the sensor and that's part of the noise Not you in get this pocket in there. camera, I'll tell you that. So I know. <laughs> Things are well, behemoth and, with fans and everything. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with the design. I, mean, I don't either. I, I could honestly do without the handle, but I know they wanted a place to put a battery, so I get it. Yeah. Um, and I uh, picked it up the other day. I'll grab it right now. I have it just here on my shelf. It has become <laughs> sort of decoration uh, for my for my set here. But this is my 5D Mark III, and when I picked this up, because uh, I was cleaning off that shelf, I realized this feels very much like that pocket camera felt in my hand in terms of like holding the grip and the size it just feels like it was stretched a few inches this way so it's it's about this size guys uh chop the the you know the prism hump off the top but this is kind of what it felt like um and you know i have that image of me holding it let me go back to it and you know it, that's that's what it is um and well, no, and, and I don't have a problem I... with it either. But yeah, everybody's on it because of the name. And oh, it's not pocket. It's like really, is it's it's four K sixty P raw for thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Like no, yeah, and and I mean that that is a really aggressive price. And now yeah. keep in mind that the. There, there is a reason I feel like people need to understand about Black Magic. Part of the reason why Black Magic is cheap is because Black Magic doesn't have features. I know a lot of people just look at the raw image and the raw performance, and you're right, and that's 100% what you're paying for in these cameras. Uh, but 
the the reason why like and a lot of people are talking about hey i bet you the black magic um 4k pocket is going to have uh, prores raw and i'm like probably not because when, when you get to like your gh5 gh5s when they record h264 they're dumping information from the sensor to a dedicated h264 encoding chip and then laying that on an sd card yeah black magic is cheaper than that they don't have any encoding chips they have a normal i don't have the specs or the white sheet on it but think of it as like they have a normal computer processor they got you know some dual core pentium something on there and it takes the raw video data and does a real life conversion into prores or into raw now if it's dumping to raw there's almost no cpu needed and when it dumps to prores prores is such an old codec and it's so minimal that it doesn't need a lot of cpu encoding either mm -hmm. anyone who's tried like obs recording on their mac can tell you that if they record a prores they use a ton of hard drive space but their cpu sits and does nothing but when they say oh i want to record h264 it goes haywire and it yeah. like uses up the whole cpu and so that's kind of the reason why something like a gh5 cost two grand and the black magic pocket while having ProRes uh, is so much cheaper and that's because it's actually cheaper to implement just ProRes and not do any hardcore compression not I think ProRes it down raw, press the yeah. yeah I think ProRes raw is going to require too much CPU power I could be wrong but I think it's going to require too much CPU power for them to do it real time on the chip that they've already built here so I feel like it's a little too little too late if this yeah. came out the next year it probably would have supported it but and, and ProRes RAW is something that I asked them about and something that I cleared up in my show about this camera. There have been people saying, oh yeah, it has ProRes RAW. No, it does not. It does not have ProRes RAW. Right now, no Blackmagic cameras have ProRes RAW implemented in them. Um, and really, they didn't show any intention of implementing ProRes RAW in it. Uh, I didn't put ProRes RAW on this list to talk about, but it was a big announcement at the show. Uh, I didn't really get to, to check it out and see what the actual workflow is with it. I don't use Final Cut, so for me, it really doesn't matter right now uh, until ProRes RAW becomes implemented in Premiere, um, or who knows, maybe someday in Resolve. And I think only if it gets implemented in Resolve will we see it in Blackmagic cameras, because I don't think Blackmagic is gonna put something in there cameras yeah. that is going to drive somebody off of their software platform i yeah it, it's business guys so while it's <laughs> while it seems like a match made in heaven you're just gonna have to live with the fact that oh no your black magic only shoots pro res or raw and not pro res yeah. raw so uh that's all i'm yeah. gonna say on that topic uh so, before keeping and us, one uh, more yeah and one more thing about the black magic too because uh, sure. i was just looking through the comments and so part of it too is that uh if, if you want, say, just like a slightly better Blackmagic Pocket, this is kind of it. I mean, the fact that they haven't changed the price on the black, on the Pocket camera is kind of ridiculous, but the fact that it's only a few hundred dollars more, uh, you can still shoot 1080 on this bigger sensor, yeah. and it's going to look better. Um, as somebody who owns the 2.5K cinema camera, it's not like that camera shoots 2.5K. Like, yes, if it's shot in RAW, it can be 2.5K. But when you record ProRes or any other format, it's recording 1080p. It's it's shrinking down 2.5K, so you don't have aliasing issues and things like that. So this camera can be a fantastic 1080p camera if it looks good. We'll see what the quality comes out to. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, it's a bigger sensor, guys. Like, yeah. that, that was the worst part, is that, like, when deciding between your GH4 and your Blackmagic Pocket, it was like, well, there's a 2x crop and there's a 3x crop. So do I like never want to get a wide angle cinematic shot or, you know, do I want uh, something that handles low light better? So here we're finally getting this up to uh, basically, I think, a 2x crop kind of on the nose. It's a micro four thirds, if I recall exactly. So, yeah, they call it they that. call it a full four thirds. A full th four thirds, yeah. Well, anyways, it's it's a bigger sensor, which means that you're not gonna have the crazy crop issue that I have, which means that now, because right now, usually when I run and gun with a black magic pocket, which I don't recommend because it stinks, but when I do do it, um, I have the Panasonic 12 to 35 on it, which then turns out to be like a 36 millimeter on the mm. wide angle lens, right? Which is like just enough to kind of do documentary film work, but you can't get wide with it when you're in a tight space and it sucks. Yeah. And so so now with this camera, I can use that 12 to 35 and it'll work just like it does on my Panasonic and get some great wide angle shots. So that's what I'm excited for. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That uh, that that sensor, even 
being bigger than that Super 16 that was in the original one is going to be a big help. Uh, one thing where it is going to be a bit of a pain in getting wide, um, uh, Trevor actually commented a little bit ago uh, talking about the crop in the 120 frames per second. So that will be windowed on a micro four third sensor. So I don't know it what that final. Uh, yeah. So I don't know what that final crop will be, but you know, if you're if you're going to shoot wide 120 frames per second. Uh, it will be windowed. There will be an additional crop. It's going to be, uh, you're going to need some, some wide, wide I, glass. Honestly, my prediction is that the 120 is not going to be usable. I, I think that really? when you start to have the higher frame rate, which means you have a higher shutter speed, it means you have to turn up your ISO. And then with the crop, uh, which keep in mind, that down sampling of the sensor really helps the footage to not be as noisy. If we didn't have that kind of technology in these cameras, 400 ISO would look pretty noisy. Yeah. So the fact that you're doing a pixel for pixel, anyone grab your GH3 or GH4 and do the like z digital zoom on your in. video mode. And you'll see that it's like, wow, even at 800, this looks a bit rougher than I was expecting it to be. So I imagine the black magic's gonna have a similar problem when you try to do high frame rate. So for me, I'm not interested in the high frame rate part that's more of a marketing thing gotcha well yeah I, I knew there'd be plenty of comments and stuff on this we'll just you know so much remains to be seen with this camera um we have we have paper and we got you know all the specs on paper and we got the whole prototypes prototypes with <laughs> unfinished color science unfinished sensor optimization we weren't able to record in it so let's just wait and let's see guys they said september um we will see uh thirteen hundred dollars um, and yeah, I like you, I, w I want clips. I want sample clips. I want, uh, ungraded clips to play with. Uh, I, I want that before I make any decision on this camera, but we're going to move on to another camera and we're just going to go with this one pretty quickly. Cause we've mentioned its predecessor, um, a few yeah. times, uh, and that is the Z cam. So, uh, Z cam, I believe they were a Kickstarter, uh, for their first one. Were they not? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, because yeah. the DJ bought a Z cam, so I'm familiar with it. I believe it was a, it might have been an Indiegogo, not a Kickstarter, but still, okay. I think it was crowdfunded. Yeah, so crowdfunded, but uh, so uh, they had uh, their their first Z cam, which was uh, smaller than this, but did have uh, a Micro Four Thirds uh, mount, and so they've come out with their second one here called the E2. Again, Micro Four Thirds, um, and it had some some interesting specs, and I, I you know I did pop by and check it out. Um, but the big thing here is that it has uh, 4K 120 FPS um, and 10 bit, uh, which is pretty amazing. It is Micro Four Thirds, so we're seeing a lot of Micro Four Thirds again. Um, and uh, they are saying that they're going to have a global shutter variant coming soon. It wasn't there at the show. Uh, it does have its own log, of course, called Z Log. Uh, but $2,000. So $2,000 for 4K. 120 FPS 10 bit. So the reason that I put this one on there and thought it was actually kind of interesting uh, is because, you know, for the size of that, it looks like it could be used as uh, a fairly decent like crash cam, slow mo cam, or put it into places where you wouldn't be able to put it in there. Um, and for, for $2,000, it might be worth taking a look at. Again, this was one where they were saying that it had uh, really good low ISO or high ISO performance, but didn't have anything to show me to prove that. Um, so I was trying to sort of prod them a little bit and see if I could get a, a sample unit sent out, um, but uh, that did not uh, did not work out <laughs> as of yet. Maybe I'll reach out to them again because uh, I was I was legitimately interested in this um, for the new stuff that they put into it for for two thousand um, dollars. I was telling you before the show, I was like maybe even that's still kind of a lot for sort of uh, what I would be using it as like a niche camera. Um, but it is a lot. I mean. Um because here you're getting like a bare essentials camera they're pricing it now understand that they're probably pricing it at something like 2000 because unlike panasonic they don't have they're they're building up their new camera company they don't have resources just on hand so building something like this you're probably paying a lot more for r d than you are at a place like panasonic where a lot of that Makes cost sense. gets mediated through other products so because uh, it's very easy with the micro four thirds format to then compare this directly with uh, a g H5, but it, it is a little bit of a different beast. I need to see some more footage from it. I can tell you that you can tell they're a young company because the first E1 
had huge software issues. Um, DJ really did not like it because it didn't work with a lot of speed boosters out of the box. It required a bunch of firmware updates when he like asked them, hey, can I get some updates or are gotcha. you guys working on this? They pushed him off. So like DJ wasn't happy with his experience with the camera. I'm hoping that they've learned a lot since then and we've really got a more professional camera put together here. I mean, having SDI out is kind of a big thing. So if you are kind of looking for, I guess, more pro camera, you yeah. could argue SDI makes it more in the broadcast market, but I don't know, man. I've, I've before I saw the new Blackmagic Pocket, I was thinking about getting the other Blackmagic Pocket or Micro, getting the Micro with the, and hooking with the up mini an SDI. EVF. Yeah, 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 with the Mini, um, so, so getting that and putting a situation of that together. So I, I'm, I don't think the global shutter is going to be worth much. They they may or may not do a good job with the global shutter. I've yet to see one of these camera companies do a good job if they're not like, yeah. you know, the Vericam or something crazy. But uh, still, I hate the fact that they have their own Z-Log. I think that's kind of annoying, but I guess everyone has to have one now. Yeah. I understand the need for log, but the fact that they like put their own like link thing on it and like try to make it a thing. I, I know, even, I think I even was joking with it about that. I was like, does it shoot like log footage? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, let me guess, Z-Log. And they were like, yeah, it's like, yeah, of course, of course it is. <laughs> yeah, got it. Uh, so interesting thing about this, um, and then we'll we'll move along. I just thought that camera was interesting, but Trevor is saying in the uh, in the chat here um, that apparently you can find a Z camera E2 footage, and also that there's a Facebook group where the engineering team comments every day. Uh, so it seems like as a budding company that is become their sort of support page <laughs> and system <laughs> there. Uh, so I will go ahead and check that out, Trevor. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, so that, that, that's an interesting camera. It's an interesting thing to keep its eye on. And I would like to take a look at that footage. So I might do that. Um, and then actually, uh, Shiznuts is moving us right along into our next topic here. He's talking about uh, kin affinity and seems so awesome. Well, hold that thought, man, because I got a few things to say about that. Um, so we're going to go and uh, our next thing that we are talking about is actually kin affinity here. Um, so they had uh, their newest camera. Of course, they have their, their Terra, uh, but their newest is the Mavo. And yes, I asked them the pronunciation and they said Mavo. Uh, so here it is. This is an actual clip of me checking it out at the show. They had it set up. Uh, but so uh, some of the things about it, and we, we had to do some digging to find out what's so special about it. Uh, you know, it's a 6K Super 35. They're saying there's going to be a 6K full frame available, 14 stops of dynamic range, 66 frames per second at 6K wide. They're calling that wide, like their usual format as opposed to anamorphic, because it does have some anamorphic modes. Uh, $8,000. Uh, so Devin, did you actually go and get hands on with this thing at the show at all? No, actually, I I had I guess more interesting stuff to look at. Uh, but oh. um, no, I mean it's it it's one of those where they're very aggressive on pricing. It's one of those where I, it, I they keep like skirting the edge. I mean, if you go on eBay right now and you say, "Hey, I want a Kinfinity camera," there's one listing for like a Kin a Kinfinity Mini or whatever it's called, like one of their first gen. Yeah, the Kina Mini, one of their first gen cameras. Um, this is not a company that's in circulation. This is not um, a company that you're going to be able to get great support with. And uh, just like me personally, last year, I, you know, the Terra was a really hot thing. I mean, it's been a hot thing for two years now, so I don't know if it's a hot thing really. But last yeah. year, I went and played with their Terra. And as soon as I turned the Terra up to 800 ISO, it got all green and noisy and crappy and it looked terrible. And I was just like, Man, this this is a lot of specs, and I'm not seeing like the quality here. I'm all their shooting seems to be in like perfect conditions. Um, that's one thing I like applaud Panasonic on. Um, not to be like a fanboy, but when they come out with a new camera, they do marking material. They make it a point to like show you like, hey, this is us using natural light. Hey, this is us using natural light in a dark place. Like they make a point to show you this is kind of like. Of course, they're gonna make it look good, but they yeah. kind of push it a little bit to show you, hey, this camera can do it. Um, and for a lot of like the kin affinity stuff it's like no it's all like beauty shots and studio lighting and all this other stuff it, it's hard to find them like out doing cool stuff and so with it's the perfect Mavo, environment for the camera yeah 
right and with the mavo they started doing like more of this like dark on street photography and stuff like that and it seems like the low lights there but you, you seem to report having issues getting your hands uh to work the camera yeah so i went and saw it on day one um and checked it out and i didn't seek them out they just you know their booth was there as i was making my rounds this year and i was like oh yeah i know about them i'll go and check it out and so uh it was working fine it was pretty cool we were you know looking at it but then we came back uh a little bit later we were passing by it and it was having some serious problems and what it was is the uh both the output and the monitor that were were on the camera uh, it was displaying at like, it, it, oh, it looked like 10 frames per second. And so we thought it was a setting and we were going in there and we were looking, we're like, no, that it's capturing it at 24 frames per second. Everything's set to 24. It was just the camera was glitching out and it was lagging. And, you know, this was their display model and nobody was there to, to fix it at the booth and repair it. Um, and we, we came back later uh, in the show and saw that it was again running smooth, you know, Maybe they just power cycled the thing or something like that. Um, but, you know, this is a company that's that's seeming to try and go after, you know, like, you know, reds and, and all those like higher end ones with their resolutions, with their, you know, body type, with all that kind of stuff. And uh, there's no support because this is a company that is based in China. They're relatively new. Um, and so if something like that happens with one of their cameras, what are you going to do? You know, if you're here in the U.S., there's no distribution in the U.S. yet, not even distribution. So you're ordering your camera from them in China. Um, but then support is a huge thing for pro users. Like they need to know, hey, my camera is down. Can you repair it? But not only that, can you also get me another camera tomorrow so that I can continue my job? Um, and that happens a lot. And of course, you know, companies with big infrastructure like Canon and uh, I believe I believe Red does it now, but I know they had issues up front uh, with with supporting customers that, you know, pro customers that needed that. Uh, Kinefinity just doesn't have that. Um, and yes, the, the product itself is a lot cheaper, but even from what I saw specifically with the Mavo at the show, uh, reliability is a complete crapshoot. It's, you know, would I trust that to go on something where I have to shoot all day and it absolutely has to work because my reputation and paycheck are on the line. No, um, right now. No. So, yeah. And I mean, it's, man, I, I feel like though, um, it's just, it's not, it's not ready for us. I mean, obviously they, they've gone and got, uh, Philip Bloom and he shot some stuff and it looks great. Cause what he shoots always looks great. That's what happens yeah. when you have a good DP. You can, and that was the, the that was the Terra. So, I mean, right. they've, they've had a and, lot well, more time to work bugs out in that one. Back when back when the company said, hey, we have a 4K camera for $4,000, and I want to say, I don't know, this was three years ago or something like that, I was like, holy crap, that's amazingly cheap, yeah. and it looks good, and it shoots raw. This is incredible. And now we're in today's world with things like a Blackmagic Pocket, and they go, hey, if you want, you can still pre-order that 4K camera for 4,000. And I'm like, why? Yeah. I go, what? What is gonna drive me to do that? I go, I, I can go. I'm like, for a lot of these package prices, I'm like, I could get an Ursa. You know, I could get a, a C300. You know, used. It's like, I'm just, I'm sorry, guys. It's, if you came out with that camera several years ago, even if it was buggy and it didn't work well, but you came out with the product and I saw it in people's hands, then I'd give you something. But yeah. the fact that when you go to their website, you can still pre-order the Terra and it hasn't changed price for years. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not saying that they're a scam. I'm just saying that like they're trying to do too much with two little people. They should focus on one maybe specialty camera. Maybe they should focus on a 4K camera, make it look really good, try to find a way to make it cost competitive and have features that Red and Ari ignore. And then I go, you have a compelling product and you can build a company out of it. But when you're on like camera six, but your last to your two newest cameras haven't shipped yet and it's been years it's like come on guys i don't know yeah. how anyone expects us to really treat them like a real camera when they just don't deliver in any regard i'm all about buying cheap stuff i unlike bart i'm even okay with like experimenting with stuff overseas that i may not get support for because a lot of stuff i'm willing to fix and do stuff myself but in this situation, I'm like, you're not shipping it. I go, there's no one I know that I can get one from. Yeah. They aren't rental houses. It's like, you're just not moving product. And so if you're building them by hand, 
I don't know. It's to me then it's like uh, it. I think they're going about it the wrong way. It's kind of like you're just pre-order funding R and D basically is what's happening. Right. It's and there's there's a reason why when Tesla first came to market, they came out with the Roadster and it was insanely priced. And that's because they came out with something special and unique and they used that money then to fund down to the more common cameras and an aggressive price point where they could compete in the market. Um, so that's that's how you you know, one way you can grow a company. And I feel like Confinity was trying to do that, but then they just went super crazy with the pricing and tried to give us the final value. Yeah. I think I man, I honestly charge another two grand for the camera if that's what it takes to ship it on time and get it in people's hands because that even though most people will be like oh i'd rather have a red uh you'll get it into the ecosystem you'll get people using people it and see it somewhere other than yeah. at a booth at a trade show yeah yeah and this is purely a trade show camera for us americans i see uh trevor in here is uh you know defending them saying it's like oh you know they're having growing pains and and all that stuff and then uh he does mention that pro av a, co a company in um pro av is a, a distributor in the uk uh is coming into play and they did mention that that they're they're gonna be uh distributing through pro av uh so at least in the uk they're starting to build up their distribution and all that stuff so i'm not knocking them completely i'm just saying there's a lot of people that are that are drooling over it and i don't think it's ready yet i don't think they're ready yet um, you know, both what I've seen from the company and what I've seen from the camera just on the show floor, uh, it, it, it's not ready. I'm not saying they won't go there. I'm not wishing, you know, I'm not, not wishing them the best of luck. Double negative. Had to make sure I got that right. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it, it's not there yet. You're right. I think they need to take a step back. I think they need to figure out what they need to do to get physical cameras that work out and into the ecosystem, uh, because seeing one on a set is a lot more convincing than seeing one at a booth so sure and and at the at the end of the day um if, for me it's more the fact that like i'm looking at the terra i pre-ordered a terra i canceled it you know yeah. after like a year and a half um so i'm one of those that really wanted a terra to ship mm -hmm. and a terra like still hasn't shipped it's still asking for pre-orders so uh, it'd be totally different if I could buy a Terra right now and have it in my hands, but they're in pre-order mode for a camera that should have been out years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, the Movi may sound exciting and everything else. I've given them time. I've given them a chance. At this point now, I'm ignoring them until they deliver because I'm not going to sit here with anticipation and bated breath over a company that just has continued to not deliver. So yeah. when it when it comes down to it, you know, and I actually have one, I'll completely change my mind. Hopefully the camera will show up, completely change my mind, and I'll be all for it. But until then, I'm in a mode where I'm like, dude, I don't care because it's just until they ship, man. Yeah. I got really excited with everyone else. I was on the hype train. I was going with it for a couple of years and now I'm done with it. And so they come out with a new one and I go, you still haven't shipped the one I was excited about it the first yeah, time. That's, so I'm, that's I'm rough waiting. to do to, to your pre-order consumers be like, look, we've got this new thing. It's like, wait, where's the one I bought? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But anyway, I'm going to keep us moving along here. Yes. Um, so we're going to move away from cameras and we're going to move into uh, some software here. Um, so the next thing that we had on the list, uh, and I'm going to toss this over to you mostly to talk about some of the new stuff, is uh, Adobe and uh, Premiere Pro. So uh, I'm a Premiere Pro user. You are a Premiere user, correct? Um, yeah. Yep. And uh, and so Premiere Pro CC uh, got some uh, got an update and got some actually really cool uh, new features. Um, I have not uh, used these new features, but uh, Tell us. I know. Cause what you're are lazy. Because you're lazy. Because I'm so, lazy. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, Premiere, Premiere Pro, uh, first off, I think over the past two years, their software has gone way more stable. I could be wrong with that. Uh, but as being my primary edit suite, I've noticed a lot less crashes. Nothing's perfect, but I notice a lot less crashes. I notice things are way stronger. Um, so I haven't had any issues with this software yet. I mean, I know there was like breaking issues at, what was it, two updates ago, where like it randomly deleted footage. That was crazy. But yeah, whoops. Uh, hopefully nothing wrong with this update so far. Uh, what I'm seeing is auto-ducking in case you're not familiar with that term, it's when you bring down your music volume for sound effects or voices to go on top. It's not something you really do a ton of or aggressively in filmmaking and cinematic stuff, but you do do it aggressively when it comes to corporate work. When yeah. there's pauses in speech and stuff like that, um, you know, like commercials and stuff like that. Some of you may know what I'm talking about when you're like, it's a documentary, there's an interview, and then when the person stops talking and you go to B-roll shots, 
the music picks music up to picks kind of up. to to take up that negative space unless you want that negative space. So it used to be a feature that was only in Audition uh, to automatically set keyframes for ducking. Now it's built into Premiere. Thank you. I don't have to do the round robin to get that done. Um, along with a, a few other audio things, and they made the tweaking a little easier now for uh, making voices easier to be understood and stuff like that. So huge thing on that. The other thing, I mean, we're talking, Premiere is all about like trying to get automatic and automating everything here, which I'm happy about because they're still allowing the pros to step in and tweak things. Yeah. Like an auto ducking feature sets keyframes and then you can change those keyframes. You key can frames. modify the keyframes. You don't just have to accept yeah. what, the, what the program decides for you. If it completely screws up, you can you can still go and, and finesse it to the way it's supposed to be. And and that's uh, and that also carries over into like the color correction because when you hit auto color, it just sets the values and then you can tweak them if you want. And they've taken that to the next level by having auto color matching with face detection. That so it's one actually, I'm really it'll... looking forward to. Like, <laughs> it's wow. actually going to look for the skin tones and it's going to try to make sure your skin tones are consistent shot to shot, camera to camera within a scene. Um, and that can save a lot of time, especially for a lot of people who aren't experienced with color or like some of us who for some reason are shooting on like a Sony and a Panasonic and you've got this thing you need to turn around tonight um, you can add that extra level of polish by doing an auto color between those two cameras so you can spend more time on That's editing awesome. or selecting music instead of spending that time tweaking those colors so you don't suddenly like go like whoa his face changed color that's weird I so... have to do that all the time <laughs> in, in my day to day work we shoot interviews and it's like we're shooting you know, an FS7, an FS5, and a GH5. So not only do I have different brands, but the FS7 sensor has a color kind of going uh, a little bit more, you know, greenish, and the FS7 or FS5 goes a little bit more magenta. And so I got to get all these things to match. And so, yeah, that auto color match between all your clips is boom. Like, that's yeah. awesome. Um, and actually, uh, Peter McKinnon did uh, a video because he of course had it for a few months before it was announced uh, to use it but he did a video very recently um, where he takes us through both the auto ducking and the uh, the color match and how he uses it for his vlog stuff to just crank them out real quick because um, of course he's got shots from different different lighting environments all sorts of stuff going on and uh, he wants to color match them boom it's done and then he does that thing where he lays you know sometimes he's talking sometimes he's going into a b-roll segment and he's got music underneath the whole thing auto ducking boom um, so if you really want to see an in-depth one, I'm not going to go into it right now because I haven't even used it, but he has a good thing showing off uh, that feature. But yeah, yeah. that's, I mean, And, and then awesome. on top of that, they've added a lot of motion graphic stuff that may not be everyone's flavor, but um, enabling um, motion graphic artists to give Premiere editors a lot more control. Um, I'm all about that. Oh, yeah. Me personally... Um, it, it's about like the efficiency where uh, I can build a lower third for a project or something like that that has like eight speakers and instead of like doing separate renders or things like that the ability to make a template which from my understanding from what I, how I see how it works is it actually like does render uh, something it doesn't render video footage if that makes any sense it's rendering some kind of uh, information in terms of blurs and everything else so when I apply it in Premiere um, there's no loss in performance and I can still change colors change check, uh, check uh, text position all this stuff and it still performs amazingly fast and it keeps my timeline super fast especially if I'm at a remote with a client with just my laptop I can render the lower third or the motion graphics at home and when I get to the client they're like uh can we pick a different font like sure no problem just put in a new font you're ready to go and so it's good to go I'm, I'm super excited about that because it really helps to enable a lot of different workflow especially working with different people that's awesome yeah um i'm gonna have to uh pop open premiere this weekend and uh and specifically uh throw some stuff in there to to really test out these uh these new features but i mean if they work the way they're supposed to and it seems like uh they should be uh awesome because yeah spending time editing let's face it not my favorite part of my workflow uh so you know <laughs> if, if they can take out those little things you know obviously if i'm doing like uh, something where i really want serious control over my grading i'm not gonna just you know blanket color match and all that kind of stuff all the time but if i'm yeah. you know shooting something vlog style now that people have requested more of it or something <laughs> like that you know uh, that's fantastic and it and a nice thing with it is it you can actually do a custom look on a clip, make that your reference clip, 
and then do the color match and yeah. apply that grade to all the others. So you, you can do some some tweaking. You know, the purists will say, like, oh, letting the computer grade your shots. Each shot requires its own attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at well, least a- if it can actually, get me close, you know? <laughs> you know what's interesting about that? Um, I don't have the article in front of me because I just thought of this. So I apologize. I have more information. But <laughs> there's a really good – I don't know if it's a TED Talk or something, but there's a really good video about a guy talking about using uh, machine learning to do mm-hmm. color grading. And it's really fascinating because um, – of all the data you can feed the machine learning algorithms, uh, it actually has really spectacular results in terms of, I mean, we're not talking Premiere here, we're talking about like a high level MIT kind of like AI thing, but having computer do color grading or at least like completely doing color matching and all this other stuff in in the very near future could be a thing where it could be absolutely perfect at color correcting and then the only thing colorists do is just grade and make it look cool you know and have that artistic expression so i'm super excited for that kind of future yeah that's that's really cool stuff um but in the essence of time i'm going to move us on to our next thing here um and this is something that you saw and i did not so again i'm gonna give the floor to you here um well, but yeah, we'll, some we'll of those go. little gems you can find around there. So this is a, a Lilliput monitor, uh, just, a, yeah. just a little guy. Uh, we saw a few 5-inch uh, announcements from the show. Of course, one of the big ones being the the Sony, or Sony, Atomos uh, Ninja 5, uh, a 5-inch monitor recorder, which I'm sure everyone was hoping we'd talk about. But guess what? I don't need it, so I'm not talking about it. Uh, but this one here... Uh, you've got the specs in there, but this is a photo you took checking it out at the show. Uh, so tell yeah. me a little bit about why uh, why this guy caught your eye and what's going on with it. Well, just real quick, it's mostly like the lightness, right? Um, it's it's not a bright monitor. It's average. It's like four, 500 nits or something like that. But the fact that it only weighs like four ounces, yeah. um, it's not, I mean, everyone's got their own ideas about hardware. Some people believe everything should be built like a tank so it can handle any drop. And there's a place and time for that. Uh, but for a lot of us guys trying to run light, run with Ronins and carry stuff all day, um, a four ounce monitor that has 4K support and also, um, you know, is a full 1080p display IPS like really solid colors and viewing angles and everything else when I talked to the rep I think he told me they're probably going to do it for about 150 and so for that price it's yeah. incredibly attractive it's got histogram audio meters focus speaking all the usual stuff that you expect um I've been eyeing um, the focus from small HD just because of its brightness because well, of now uh, there's like a family of five different I versions know. of it now there's but that's, um, you know, because of the outdoor brightness thing, I went, yeah, that's actually really cool. But in some situations, I go, man, just having a light monitor, because part of my problem is that um, uh, I'll have an EVF, like 3.5 inch screen with a little uh, uh, piece of glass in front of it. And I'll be using that the whole time. And then sometimes I work with a director who like really, I don't know, like wants to see it, like, like I'll open up the EVF so that we can both see the screen. And then he'll like try to shove his head in the way of my to head and see what's there. going on screen. Oh. And I don't, I don't blame him, but in the run and gun documentary style, I go, I don't have time to like set up a uh, like video village for you. Yeah. And so, and, and I've been hesitating, like using the aperture seven inch because it's so big and it it's adds so much weight me, to yeah. my rig. But considering that I'm already running a, a gold mount battery, a power solution on my rig and everything else for shooting all day, adding four ounces is not that big of a deal. And I can stick it on the side of the camera away from me. And with the IPS display and maybe like a small hood or something like that, he can stay out of my way and I can do my job. Yeah. Uh, if you he, know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I, I see here in the comments, uh, we've got a lot of people talking about, like I expected uh, that, uh, that Atomos, the, uh, the Ninja Five, um, and, and yeah, that's a great thing. And I see comments in here that saying like, really happy to see that that five-inch monitor size is being embraced. You know, Small HD did yeah. it last year with the Focus. Uh, Atomos is going back to to, to five-inch now, um, or, or at least with this Ninja Five. Um, and now you've got that Lilliput monitor. But if you don't need all the functionality of that that Ninja Five, if you have a situation like you were just talking about, where literally you need a lightweight monitor to go on your small camera rig. 150 bucks IPS panel takes 4K in and is a full 1080 display. I mean, that's yeah, that's a great that. find. Yeah, that, it's yeah. it's fantastic. That's you know that's amazing. You know we don't always need every bell and whistle built into it. Sometimes you just need a freaking screen. Um, yeah. 
And yeah, that's uh, that, that's a really cool option. I'm glad you found that at the show because uh, I, I will say it was it was last year. Um, I was talking to the to Ted from uh, from Aperture, and I was telling them I was like, you know, like uh, they had just done the uh, the VS the Aperture VS five X, which was like their VS five, which had already been out, but w with cross converting. Um, and I told him I was like, you know, you should really look into doing like a five inch monitor. And he was like, oh, he's like, I don't know. And I was like, I guarantee you, man. I was like, there's so many uh, cameras now that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And people are wanting smaller and smaller. They don't want these huge monitors. And they're like, oh, maybe we'll look into it. And then, of course, the very next day, small HD is like five inch focus. And it was huge. Like everyone's talking about it. And I was like, yeah. see, see, five inch. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people are looking for that. And so lilliput one of those companies man that you know at first their stuff was garbage i have one of their really old monitors that is just so bad i but dude i they aren't bad i do too they're they're all like bought, 720 i bought a displays. real cheap real old bad one oh, okay. i still have you bought, it you, okay but, but i i the first gen right i bought the second gen where they were building the bodies out of metal um i actually still use it for like my top down rig for like shooting uh things happening on the desk uh but that that panel was ips 720 i think i got it for a little over 200 um l keep in mind guys so there's like a lot of different brands lilliput tends to be the one that has better software a lot of brands will gotcha. buy the same panel they'll buy the same chips but they don't provide software they all share the same software that came from the manufacturer Lil Lilliput tends to add a few features. I haven't seen them really do a firmware upgrade, but they always enable a firmware upgrade to happen if they have to. So I'd like to see how this guy does with delay. That was my one main complaint about Aperture 7-inch. Uh, gotcha. um, I kind of stopped using it after a while just because of the delay. I know it seems silly, and I know that there's processing and things going on there, uh, but when you stick it on because you're like in a dark area and you're trying to do a pan and tilt, follow things on a stage or something like that, having that delay just kind of, even though it's only maybe like three frames or something like that, it throws me off when I'm trying to follow a subject. Yeah, that's so a call. It, it'll work great for a director or any of those guys, but I was kind of like, eh, it's not for me in terms of an operator cam uh, monitor. So no idea on this one. I, I w didn't have a chance to test out this guy, but um, that's one thing to keep in mind when you're looking for cheap monitors is see, see how the delay is. Yeah. And with this guy, I mean, even if it does have a little bit of delay, 150 bucks to get that director out of your freaking <laughs> face. That's, uh, that's a small price to pay. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. I'm going to pull up the chat just real quick uh, before we get to our last thing. But yeah, we got a lot of people talking about the prices of monitors coming down and all these different companies, uh, you know, Feel World, ICANN, uh, lots of stuff there. But like Devin just said, um, you know, check, check that latency, check that kind of stuff, guys, because, you know, they are not all built the same. Um, and while prices on monitors are coming down to be very reasonable, if you're finding something that's like super dirt cheap, Maybe maybe look into it a little bit more, because uh, because uh, yeah, there is yeah. still a too good to be true, even though the uh, the prices are coming down to being really reasonable. And and really quick about the brands too, because uh, people are saying Andy Cine and Feel World. Mm -hmm. um, a Annie Cine and Field World are using the same panels that uh, okay. Lilliput does. The reason why I usually error on the side of Lilliput is because uh, like year after year at NAB and everywhere else, I usually see Lilliput putting out these like first sample monitors and then seeing everyone else then go on top of it. So I th think that Lilliput is either the manufacturer or is closely related with the manufacturer where they're controlling a lot of the technology and where it goes, but they aren't doing much, they, they aren't doing a different uh, price than most of these other monitors, but they tend to have a lot better support from my experience, as much support as you're gonna get from a cheap monitor company. So. Cool. Yeah, uh, but support's Andy Cine important. is also a good one too. So check out Annie Cine because sometimes their prices will be cheaper because they'll have a sale or something like that. But you guys are right. A lot of these things are shared panels. Um, I hate the old Field World tech, but I've heard that they've gotten way better. So <laughs> I should probably look at them again. But after my EVF broke after two months, uh, I stayed yeah. away from Field World for a while. I did review one of their monitors, which I believe has already been updated to. So my review is like, hey, yeah. if you want to see what the old model was like, it was OK. <laughs> but, you know, it had some issues. But anyway, that's a story for another day. Um, we're closing in actually on the uh, hour and a half mark. Uh, this is definitely the longest show we've ever had, which is awesome. But we got a lot to uh, cover. And uh, thank you guys for sticking around in the chat and having a lively conversation. That's great. Uh, very last thing that I want to talk about is actually the first thing that I have uh, 
purchased at the show. So I didn't like purchase it and get to bring it home with me, but I purchased it while I was right there at the booth. I showed the guy my phone. It was like B and H order done pre-ordered. Um, and that was this guy right here. Uh, this is the, let's see if I could actually make it fit in this window here. No, of course I can't. There we go. So it's the Lassie Copilot uh, two terabyte drive. And what this is, is it's a, a drive they designed in collaboration with DJI. So they say, you know, it's got DJI grayish colors and, and all that stuff on it. Um, it's a two terabyte drive. Uh, it's got a built-in battery, but the highlight is that it has all these ports and connections and actually an SD card reader. Um, and the cool thing about this drive is uh, it's there's a lot of similar products out there. There's stuff like the Narbox. Uh, Western Digital has a few drives that allow you to back up while you're in the field. Um, and also stuff like the Narbox gives you additional functionality where you can even like edit on it. Um, but I really never liked any of the implementation and how sort of overly complicated the process was with those. And this one looked like, because I had seen it before the show, it looked like it would be perfect. It looked like it was so simple. Um, and so I went to their booth, had them demo it for me, and it was so straightforward. I love the way it, it, it makes folders based on the time and date. And then within there, it pulls the name of the card, creates a subfolder and dumps all that stuff. So all of your stuff is organized, not just dumped into one big pool at the end of the day, various cameras, whatever you can do. Um, so it has that SD card slot into it to do, uh, you know, offload that way. But it also has a USB 3.0 port as well as a USB C port, both of which can be used to connect any card readers or whatever you want. So you can connect anything to this without a computer. And then it's just a double tap and uh, it starts offloading. And it's just, it's really fantastic. Um, and then you can, of course, connect it to a computer, uh, or not to a computer, sorry. Yeah, you can connect it to a computer, but uh, you can connect it to an iOS or an Android device. It comes with cables for both. Um, so the cables are not permanently connected to it, which was a big thing for me. Sometimes drives come with a permanently attached cable, and if your cable goes bad, your whole drive, you can't use it. Um, but it allows you to view and sort of manage your media um, without a computer again, you know, just with your phone or an iPad or whatever you have with you. Um, and then the other awesome thing is that with those USB ports, you can connect another hard drive to it. Um, and then either copy stuff from that hard drive over to the copilot, or you can completely duplicate all of your footage from the copilot over to the additional drive. So now with just your phone, this thing, and one other hard drive, you can not only dump all your footage, but create a redundant backup before you're even back to civilization or whatever. Um, and so I do a lot of shooting out in remote places where I'm managing my cards and all this stuff. You know, I was out in the desert in Sedona and stuff like that recently. Um, and this thing would be freaking awesome. And of course it's designed like their rugged drives, you know, it's a waterproof, uh, splash for not waterproof, but water resistant splash and dust proof. And it has a, a gasket, uh, on there. I can show it again that, that seals it up. Um, and all that and I just thought it was a really good design um, and then it was only $320 for this two terabyte drive um, to get it from B&H and I think that's still the deal but uh, it's not available yet it's pre-order they're saying like the end of this month uh, but yeah I uh, I was impressed if you can't tell <laughs> and uh, and I bought it and uh, I see some comments there uh, it is not an SSD so that's the one thing that it does not have going for it um, it is a spinning drive, uh, but I felt that the features for the price was pretty amazing. Um, oh, and of course it has its own built-in battery. So, you know, to obviously to run it, but you can charge devices off of it as well. So it's, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, me. I mean, I, I would love to see the copy times on that. One of the reasons why I didn't pick up a Western Digital version of this uh, it's because the Western Digital SSD, like they'd have like a USB 3.0 port or something like that, but yeah. then like the SD slot would be running at 2.0 speeds or something like that. Uh, it's just, it's one of those where I'm like, man, if it's gonna take a couple hours to copy, then this isn't really saving me anything. And I'm, I'm surprised how long it's taken for this product, this type of product, to come out me and too. be good. Because like Western Digital keeps teasing it, and I think in the newest revision they may have finally like sped things up and got it pretty good. But all the things listed here, I don't know. I feel like we should have had this two years ago. Yeah, I just for feel real. Like I do too. Uh, 
but maybe maybe it takes this company and this uh with dgi to get it done because geez it's just it's been too long i wish there was um uh a few more options in terms of feedback like uh, you'd be asking too much but some kind of small like lcd display there um, is um yeah, really so on the top of it you can't really see oh, it here I see. Yeah, uh, yeah so I it, see. it's really interesting the way that I they mean, did more this information than that more information than just like okay your copy's like 50 percent done yeah um, yeah you can't go through and like see like the file structure and whatnot or whatever it, it but it I, does have the it, it's really it's it like invisible it looks like it's like in the metal like a part of it it pops up it'll show you yeah. how much space is remaining it'll show you like wh how much battery is remaining Six of what you need to know yeah. yeah so it's like single clicks to just scroll through the menu it just has one single button and then a double click. I hope it would have uh, time estimations. Um, yeah, and who, who knows? Happens. I mean, maybe that's available in a firmware update. Because that, that's my main thing is like when I plug it in, I need to know how long, especially with it being a spinning drive, how long to let it sit and let it do its thing. Yeah. Really, I know that's yeah. not everyone's concern, but when I'm like trying to get in and out of a place, it'd be super helpful. That's one thing I liked about the uh, Aperture Amaran lights was having a countdown timer on the battery. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so time remaining. I don't. Sometimes you know you cut stuff close, and yeah. you want to know exactly how many minutes you have left until uh, you're done. So. And so I will say that one thing that they told me about this uh, is that the battery is supposed to last for about 500 gigs of transfer. Nice. Okay. So it is a two terabyte drive, but I was sitting there and I was like, well, I can just plug a, a USB battery pack into it as well while it's doing it, right? So I can have. Yeah. I can have. A card reader, I can have an SD card in it, and I can have my USB battery pack plugged into it and just let that sucker run, uh, which is pretty cool. I mean, yeah, I got a handful of devices now, but I got a handful of devices that are, you know, this freaking big. That's better yeah. than dragging my laptop out to the desert and having to sit in the car and offload stuff and do whatever. So I thought it was pretty cool. I can't wait to get my yeah. hands on it. I'll let people know uh, what I think. Uh, Trevor is asking in the comments, uh, does it have wireless built into it the way the Narbox does? No, it does not. It does not wirelessly connect to your device. It is a wired connection, but uh, that's fine for me. Like I said, I didn't want the the full featured version where I'm not I'm not editing on my iPad. I'm not editing on my phone. Literally, this just uh, you can connect to your phone and it lets you just view thumbnails of all the media um, and all that kind of stuff to make sure that everything's there. And one note that I did want to make, there is a feature where you can click it on and it'll do a checksum after you've transferred your footage. So it'll go through byte by byte and make sure that everything has copied and is there, uh, which is something that I know, you know, pro people use software to do that, to offload their footage, make sure that nothing's been corrupted, make sure that nothing's been missed, make sure that every bit and byte have been copied over. So this can do that. It will take double the time because it's copying everything over and then rereading through everything and comparing it but i mean when your footage is valuable and you're in a remote location that you can't really just go back and reshoot anytime uh that's a small price to pay so all right well, I, always, I like the design of it i just i yeah it is it is pretty cool <laughs> and and too on that wi-fi comment i i don't know about you and what you're i'm Maybe if you're shooting DJI footage, it's a different story. But when I'm pulling stuff off of GH5 or something like that, we're talking about huge files that aren't going to stream very well over Wi-Fi. So I feel like it's yeah. a moot point for me anyways. Because yeah. I doubt the hard drive is going to do like live transcoding down to a smaller format so that my phone can read it. I mean, if it did do that, it would be amazing. But it probably costs more than I'd be willing to spend. But in any case, uh, no, the wired thing just makes sense to me. And I've got no problems with it not having Wi-Fi. Well, and it's the difference between draining the battery on it faster as it broadcasts yeah. a wireless signal, draining the battery on your phone faster as it tries to maintain connection with that wireless device versus plugging in a hardwired connection and literally charging your phone while this is happening, you know? And you're not going to be far away from something like a Narbox anyway. Like, do you really not have to yeah. have a... a, a t I think the tether is just... it. It's a, not a huge inconvenience at all. <laughs> Uh, if anything, it's a benefit. Like I said, charges your phone while you're doing it. So, um, but yeah, that is it. That is everything that I had in the show notes. Obviously, guys, there was a ton more stuff than we mentioned here at NAB. Lots and lots and tons of stuff that we didn't even probably get a chance to see and discover. And there will be plenty of YouTube videos from other people coming out. And I'll be like, well, how did I miss that? 
but these are some of the things that Devin and I saw, both good, bad, disappointing, sketchy, whatever. Um, and yeah, overall, how do you feel the, the show was this year? Did you have a good time? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, um, the show's good every year, but it's all about, uh, you know, the people you go and see and the people you hang out with. Um, I sure. mean, at least Black Magic coming out with a camera, um, along with like Z Cam, those to me are like, okay, this is something happened. Last year was really dead. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was the, the like curtain for the EVA one or whatever it was from Panasonic. Oh, yeah. Um, Under the so shroud. I, mean, like, I know. So besides that, like, there just isn't. NAB usually doesn't have a lot going on and guys NAB is like really huge and I mean that in it's gigantic um, there's there's uh, uh, half of my time was actually spent in areas that d most of you guys aren't interested in terms of like content management and fiber networking and interconnects as well as like a, a lot of corporate CDN kind of stuff um, as well as like Ross and stuff like that. Every, you know, Black Magic always has a big booth, but yeah. then like you go over to the broadcast side and like you've got Ross over there with like twice the size, you know, of the, in their yeah. booth because they have like twice the gear. I've got my own complaints about Ross, but <laughs> anyways, <laughs> we don't need to get into that. But yeah, NAB is a ton of fun. It's all about meeting new people and sharing new experiences. To me, it's more about uh, the people I get to hang out with than the gear, and that's why I go every year. Yeah, for sure. And uh, and this year, admittedly, I did it uh, right. Because uh, <laughs> in past years, you know, I've, I've gone around and I've been really focused on the gear and I've done all those booth interviews and stuff like that. And I, I know you guys on the channel love that. Uh, but it means that I don't get to explore as much. I don't get to hang out and meet people and make connections as much. Um, and, you know, I met you in person for the first time at the show last year. And uh, and here we are now. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's a great show, great experience. A lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool uh, potential uh, for technology advancements. Um, a few physical products that, you know, may find their way into my uh, into my inventory. Uh, one, obviously, that already has. Uh, and uh, but yeah, it was good. So, uh, guys, uh, I'd love to stick around and do uh, some more questions and stuff. But it looks like uh, most people are winding down and going through it. Um, but we are just over an hour and a half, uh, and so I am going to go ahead and wrap this guy up. Uh, but Devin, thank you very, very much for uh, for not only joining me and spending this time. I know it's earlier for you over on the uh, the left coast over there. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for for hanging out and doing this, and also for helping me to figure out how to do this in the first place. Like I said at the beginning of the show, guys, he's the one who helped me get the live stream up and and working at all in the first place. So. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'm always out to uh, to help people out. Anytime you guys have a question, feel free to fire away. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again, Devin. Guys, unfortunately, I won't be around next week. I'm traveling to Austin, uh, Texas, so we will not have a show next Saturday, uh, but we will be having one after that on Cinco de Mayo. Uh, so I'll figure out something for that. But uh, all you guys who hung out here live, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you can hang out with us as we do more shows uh, like this in the future. Uh, again, thank you to Devin for coming by, and uh, I will see you guys next time. All right? Peace.